Good morning. If you uh, have your Bibles, you can turn to Joel chapter 3, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 16. And so we read, Yes, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and take them to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment with them there because of my people, my inheritance, Israel. The nations have scattered the Israelites in foreign countries and divided up my land. They cast lots for my people. They bartered a boy for a prostitute and sold a girl for wine to drink. And also, Tyre, Sidon, and all the territories of Philistia, what are you to me? Are you paying me back or trying to get even with me? I will quickly bring retribution on your heads. For you took my silver and gold and carried my finest treasures to your temples. You sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks to remove them far from their own territory. Look, I am about to rouse them up from the place where you sold them. I will bring retribution on your heads. I will sell your sons and daughters to the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabians, to a distant nation, for the Lord has spoken. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for holy war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the men of war advance and attack. Beat your plows into swords and your pruning knives into spears. Let even the weaklings say, I am a warrior. Come quickly, all you surrounding nations. Gather yourselves. Bring down your warriors there, Lord. Let the nations be roused and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit down to judge all the surrounding nations. Swing the sickle because the harvest is ripe. Come and trample the grapes because the winepress is full. The wine vats overflow because the wickedness of the nations is extreme. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will cease their shining. The Lord will roar from Zion and make his voice heard from Jerusalem. Heaven and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the Israelites. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we would come to delight in you and, and to rest in the sobering but yet joyful judgment that you bring to bear, that through your judgments um, we are brought to our knees in repentance and faith, and that in Christ you have satisfied that judgment that we can stand before you. I pray that we would rest in your presence and that we would delight in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. In the first two chapters of Joel, we find the themes of the judgment of Israel leading to their conviction of sin, their sincere repentance and faith, and the pouring out of the Spirit on God's people, and the Spirit drawing them to trust in the promises of God that are fulfilled in Christ. First, God addresses his grievances against Israel, his people, and he leads them by his grace to be restored and then moves outward to judge Israel's enemies. This is so unlike us today, who in our world, we either deal with the self by telling us to clean our rooms or get our act together, and we'll provide all the self-help gurus to meet our goals. But if we don't, there is no grace or forgiveness to redeem the brokenhearted. Or the more popular move is to move away from addressing our own sinful contributions to this dark world and shift the blame on others. And why do we do this? Because the thought of judgment for our sins frightens us and the weight of it becomes too much to bear. So we put the blame of our problems on someone else 
as a coping mechanism to ease our consciences and then to bury our sins deep into the recesses of our hearts, we fall prey to the messaging of the world who give us false comforts by saying things like, Jesus draws in circles, not straight lines. As if that makes God's judgment go away. Yes, Jesus wants to include, but he also will separate the sheep and the goats. It is not an either or, but a both and. And that is the tension that we find in Joel, that we must hold together, which is that we desire for all people to know Christ and experience the benefits of the salvation he freely gives, while also longing for his justice, that all wickedness be addressed, all wrongs be righted, and justice to prevail when Christ comes again to judge the living and the dead. What I find so comforting in Joel is that God's justice is not pitted against his love, but they are united to demonstrate to the universe the glory and majesty of God by which he rules the nations. Don't fall for the world's arguments when they try to deconstruct God by breaking him into parts and pitting his love up against his justice, forcing you to pick one, and then contradicting themselves by passing judgment on you if you pick the wrong one. How arrogant we can be in the modern West. God is not a Lego tower that we can break into parts, manipulate, and then reconstruct in our own image. One says God is love, and the other says that God is just. We say pox on both your houses. God is love, love, but he also is just. And both his love and justice are so wonderfully united in the Godhead and perfectly demonstrated on the cross as Christ satisfies God's justice and simultaneously displays his love for his people by uniting them to the Father. God is not made in the image of man, but man is made in the image of God. We would do well to keep a clear distinction between God's holy transcendence and our creatureliness before we cast dispersions on his judgment against his creation who is in disobedience to him. So we read in verses 1 through 3, Yes, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and take them to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment with them there because of my people my inheritance, Israel. The nations have scattered the Israelites in foreign countries and divided up my land. They cast lots for my people. They bartered a boy for a prostitute and sold a girl for wine to drink. The charges that God brings against the nations are public in nature. All the countries that held Israel in contempt are now being brought forth in the public square. Those countries that have sat in derision against Israel are now entering into a day of reckoning. Israel was under the judgment of God via the locust plagues and were the laughing stock of the nations. And now the situation is completely reversed. The nature of being judged in public goes against the very grain of our highly, highly individualized modern and Western way of life, right? If we can't stand any sort of judgment, and if it is to occur, it must be done in private, away from everyone else. We forget that we are social creatures and that our sins don't just negatively affect ourselves, but also those around us as well. What you allow into your so what you allow into your heart and meditate on the idols that you allow settle on your soul don't just harm you but others as well. Our Lord says that out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. When our expectations aren't met at home, do we hold in our disappointment and it just magically goes away? What Against our spouse or children. Workers or those whom we manage don't meet our demands. Do we become irritable or sharp tongued? One of the tenets of being Baptist is protecting the individual conscience, and rightly so, but not as the world does. 
We don't say, do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anyone. That may have some legal bearing from a human perspective and in distinguishing church and state, but not before the eternal sovereign judge who rules his divine court with righteousness and holiness. Just as our sins affect one another and aren't strictly private in nature, so will God's righteous judgment be made known before all. But the judgment that God makes here is not one against his people, but on behalf of his people. He doesn't just convict us of our sin, pour out his spirit, and give us his righteousness, but he also defeats his enemies. And he doesn't just defeat them, but he absolutely demolishes them. When God sets out on a task, he closes, he finishes, he is committed. That is so unlike us, or at least so unlike me. I might do a task and get about 50% done and think, eh, that's good enough. On a good day, maybe 70% might satisfy me. I, I may be the most unambitious, unambitious person I know. I don't think I could promote myself out of a wet paper bag. At Miami, when I was finishing my accounting degree, I went through so many different interviews and did horrible because I'm just not the most career-driven person. When the interviewer tells you what's your greatest weakness and you give them the impression that you're not career-driven, that they're probably not going to hire you. But my point is that God is so ambitiously committed to demonstrating his glory that he doesn't just stand outside of physical reality, but he enters into it to render judgment. He steps off his throne and enters into creation to demonstrate and victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. He doesn't just take it 70% of the way, and then we do the rest. This is the great reformational principle of Christ's sufficiency. We don't just need him, but he is also all that we need in order to stand before the judgment of God. We sometimes struggle with the judgment texts because from a human perspective, we have seen it go horribly, horribly wrong, where power has been abused and the helpless taken advantage of. But if the depths of our sin are not laid bare before the foot of the cross, then our wounds can't be healed and our sins can't be washed clean. It is in the cross that Christ's love is perfectly revealed and God's justice totally satisfied. In reading this text in verse 1, when he says, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, it's just good to hear. It, it can't be overstated enough. The degree to which God demonstrates his love towards his people, that we are the apple of his eye, and that he delights in protecting us from his enemies. And as Peter says to Christ, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where else can we turn to to find one who fights for us as our Lord does? The world? It will only protect you to the degree that you have something to offer. But if you have nothing to bring to the table, then it will dispose of you like a washed up rag. Politics? You may win an election or two, there's a wide gap between what our civic leaders promise and what they can actually deliver on. Turning to the world may give partial half-hearted victories, and they have their place, but the victory that Christ provides is not just temporal, but it is eternal. In verse 2, the phrase, the valley of Jehoshaphat, is used, which can also mean the valley of decision which you also see in verse 14. And the decisions being made, church, aren't by us, but are from God, and they are final in their very nature. Our culture talks so much about the injustices committed against each other, and rightfully so, 
But what about the offenses and injustices that are made against God on a daily basis? The God who gives us the very air we breathe who sustains the entire universe by the power of his word for us to inhabit and enjoy, who sustains all of the capital markets, the transportation systems and infrastructure that we daily depend on, the God in whom we live and move and have our being, who is patient, merciful, and abounding in steadfast love toward his creation, the God who in his eternal love for his creation willingly, without compulsion, stepped off the divine throne and lay naked, hammered to a cross in the most vulnerable way imaginable because he loves his creation. This is the God that the world wants to call unfair for not providing more than one way for salvation or unfair for judging unrighteousness? I can't remember the theologian, but I think he said something to the effect that it is an awful place to be standing the opposite side of God at the day of decision and tell him that what Christ did on the cross isn't good enough. If we are called to correct the injustices done to one another, is God not called to address those injustices done against him? So we read the charges by God that are brought forth against his enemies. In verse 3, they cast lots for my people. They bartered a boy for a prostitute and sold a girl for wine to drink. And then in verse 5 and 6, For you took my silver and gold and carried my finest treasures to your temples. You sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks to remove them far from their own territory. When you are living in a time when you are willing to sell children, girls and boys, to have your material pleasures satisfied, when a nation is willing to do grave damage to the imago dei, to satisfy its base passions, then that people has estranged themselves from God and has rightly incurred judgment against them. And a good and just God will not clear the guilty. And if the world's response is, that's not me, I don't do those things, then we go to the Sermon on the Mount, where our Lord so comprehensively deals with the self-righteous, where God's judgment seems to be even stronger toward the morally self-righteous than the openly wicked. Now, when I read this, and I read this text, I've I've found that the, the now, not yet, the paradigm that we talk about all the time, um, it is very, very helpful here. That, that yes, God's judgment of the nations has been occurring ever since Adam fell. Um, but it will occur in finality when the end of all things comes. And yes, even though we live in a carnal, dark world, God grants his peace to those who come to him in faith and repentance. And that peace will abound perfectly when Christ comes again. And yet, despite these great truths, I think it's good to be honest with, with ourselves that we, that we confess that even though we confess God's sovereignty outwardly and we speak of his providence, but inwardly we may sometimes say, but why does it seem like we are losing? Why does it seem like everything is so chaotic? It seems healthy to, to me to admit that we don't always trust God, do we? We say outwardly all the right things. We quote all the Bible verses. We go to all the events. We go through all the catechisms. But we also are inwardly asking all kinds of questions. Does he really have this under control? And I think it's good to ask those questions because if we don't confess our doubts and distrust, then we can't receive the healing and the gospel medicine that heals the wounds of doubt in our souls. I don't know how to interpret the things in the world right now. Maybe it's my youthfulness that I want to intellectually figure things out and I listen to all the best podcasts to construct all the right arguments in order to fit my system of thought. And there, maybe there's some merit to that. But as been, has been said by many Christians before, the more we, we begin to know, the more we realize we don't know. 
and reason has its place, but increasingly, I find myself putting more and more limitations on it. And through Joel, a very comfortable understanding that outside of the power of the Spirit, working in man's heart to produce faith and repentance, there is no hope. And it's through the third person of the Trinity that we are awakened to the realization that beyond the judgment that we are facing from the world, God is standing outside of that as our guardian and safe haven, protecting us from the fiery darts of the devil and hiding us in the cross. He doesn't take the hurt away on this side of things, but he is with us through it. And this is where if you are more of an anxious person like myself, that I, I, I have to acknowledge my own selfishness and being consumed with all the bad stuff happening to me, that I forget to see the progress of God's glory working through judgment to demonstrate his power over his creation. The world can't see it because it doesn't have eyes to see it. The move God is making here by proclaiming the total defeat of his enemies is to provide a comforting assurance that the Lord is near to his people. He sees the wickedness around us. He has not forgotten his church, but will come to vindicate his righteousness. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. The grounding of our assurance is not in lofty arguments of reason, our own self-righteousness or moral ability, how many friends we have on Facebook or how popular we are, but it is found in the Spirit attaching himself to the Word to come alongside us in our time of need, giving us stability that the enemies of God will be overcome. This word of God's judgment over Israel's enemies would have done nothing if the outpouring of the Holy Spirit had not come first in chapter 2. Satan will not have the last word. Just as the Father through the Holy Spirit rose Jesus from the dead, giving him the victory over sin, so too will the church become victorious over enemies. So, a few takeaways um, as, I, as I'm reading this, I, I don't think that in this text God is uh, calling us to be overly triumphalist in our disposition. Um, if you're reading the same text that I am, there's not much for you and I to be triumphalistic about because we don't do anything here. God calls out his enemies and God destroys his enemies. Before we even come on the scene, I'm trying to look for what my role is, and uh, nope, I'm not trying to be crass, but God already did like Jackie Chan on everybody. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's good that God fights for, our, fights for us. And, and if I even tried to do all of that, I, I don't think I'd do it very well, and very quickly I would, I would be in sin, but God does it perfectly because he is God. But I, I do think that God calls us to have a posture of um, Christ on the cross. Um, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I, I find that very helpful because on the cross, God, Jesus is addressing people's sins, right? And he calls us to also. But very quickly, you're made known, well, oh, wait a second, I should be on that cross. I deserve that judgment. I was once God's enemy, but yet he showed mercy and grace to me. And so we are called to extend that to our neighbor, pointing them, don't, pointing them of their sin, but also driving them to the cross. And lastly, in, in verse 16, I, I find this like really wonderful and something to, to think about. The Lord will roar from Zion and make his voice heard from Jerusalem. Heaven and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the Israelites. I, I love the theme of God as a refuge. It's all throughout the Psalms. It's a wonderful place to go to. Um, we often are tempted to build our own sinful refuges that quickly show to be straw. Um, but God's refuge is steady and can withstand the onslaught of the world. I do enjoy the song, Christ, 
a sure and steady anchor that he is our refuge, that we are to look to him in these times, for he is a good, safe refuge to abide in.